Why do some guys end up as nice guys? What is the cause of nice guy syndrome? Today's podcast, we're going to be looking into that. I'm going to share what I've learned from working with these guys for many years and of course for, from being one of these guys my entire life. Now, I think very few men become nice guys suddenly and spontaneously in adulthood, even though the, the nice guy behavior might kick in at a certain point in time, like in their first relationship or when they first leave high school and go into the world, uh, the underlying elements were always there. I've never in my career or in my life seen a guy spontaneously become one after being like something completely different, something else entirely. So I believe quite firmly at this point that it is rooted in childhood, as all things are. And it is a strategy to deal with childhood trauma. Perhaps the trauma may have occurred in high school, um, you know, when you transition into your peer group being the most important people in your life, from, you know, your parents previously being the most important. But I think for the most part, parenting is where it's happening or at least early school experiences, which again are still quite tied to parenting. I saw an interview with Dr. Gabo Mate, uh, the trauma specialist, and he was asked, you know, can anyone really have trauma after childhood? Is, is it always about childhood, you know, or can you have it afterwards? And the interviewer said, you know, what about when people go to war and they come back traumatized? And he said, and I haven't confirmed this, but he said, well, what you find is that if 100 people go to war, only 20 come back traumatized, even though the whole 100 had the same experience. And of those 20, you'll find that they all have childhood trauma anyway, and the war just triggered off that trauma. So he believes all trauma is childhood related. That basically, if you have a great childhood, you cannot be traumatized. You just can't. You'll get over it. You'll heal. You'll grow through things that are traumatic, even horrible things like going through war. And I have a tendency to believe him with everything I've observed in psychology so i think it's really helpful to see nice guy syndrome as a childhood strategy to traumatic events which is why it doesn't work very well being a nice guy doesn't work very well because it's something that a kid came up with to deal with things like parents and other kids it's not something that works well in the adult world in fact it backfires quite badly in the adult world because of course a plan that a kid made up isn't going to go well now, as a coach and as a friend, I've helped literally thousands of men recover in some way, make some progress from being nice guys into being confident and authentic, you know, and it isn't a huge range of stories that I'm hearing, okay? These guys don't have a wildly varied childhood experience. They basically all go through mostly the same shit, with some exceptions, but even the exceptions, a whole category of nice guys go through the same exception. So what I'm going to share is 10 that I thought of off the top of my head. There may be more than 10, but the 10 that I see the most consistently and the 10 that I think have the biggest impact and kind of if you have one on this list, you only need one, uh, you've got a real shot at becoming a nice guy. And of course, if you have many on the list, which most of my clients do, then you've got almost no choice but to become a nice guy. So these won't all apply to you, but if one does... That could explain everything. It only takes one. Children are very sensitive. They're very absorbent. They're very malleable. You know, you can change a child's trajectory with a single sentence. They're so sensitive to change. It's so easy to adjust a child, to manipulate them, to control them. So it doesn't take much to cause trauma. And it can even be something that's misinterpreted by the child. It wasn't even a negative thing, but they heard it wrong and so on. So it's amazing how sort of hair trigger sensitive children are and how easy it is to fuck them up basically now I've, I've started this conversation assuming that i'm talking to people who are quite familiar with nice guy syndrome but just in case you aren't i've got to emphasize what i mean by it which is a guy usually a man who engages in consistent and frequent people pleasing behaviors or at least the passive version of avoiding disapproval so they either seek approval or avoid disapproval as a primary motive, especially when they're in, obviously, social situations. So they will compromise their own values. They might not even know what their values are. They will 
give up being honest and brave in order to get good reactions from people. They are so obsessed with being liked and with controlling the emotional state of themselves and everyone around them. That's nice guy syndrome. Of course, there's more to it. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. When I say a nice guy, I don't just mean someone who's like confidently generous and gregarious and enjoys life. I mean somebody who uses niceness to control other people's emotions so that he feels safe. You also got to understand before I go into the list that nice guy syndrome is just one possible response to childhood trauma and the kind of traumas that I'll be talking about today. And not everyone reacts to it this way. You know, two guys can go through the exact same childhood and go quite different directions with how they respond to it. So not everyone's going to become a nice guy if they have these experiences. There's something inherent in nice guys that we have in common. And I think it's something good. I think it's just a genuine, pure belief that only a child can have. You know, only, only children can have pure beliefs, you know. This kind of purity of wishing the best for others, of having so much empathy that it actually harms you to see other people harmed, to have a sense of righteousness and fairness about the way people should behave, a kind of innate morality about people being good and how they shouldn't be bad where possible. Now, of course, there's going to be lots of different takes on this, but generally believing that if something harms another person is probably wrong. If something helps another person, it's probably right. I think the people who end up with nice guy syndrome were children who started with their basic moral philosophy of right and wrong, you know, helpful versus harmful. Now, there are plenty of kids who don't mind harming someone else or are selfish uh, or aren't particularly bothered by other people, you know, apathetic, and they're going to go in a different direction to these childhood traumas. They're not going to develop nice guy syndrome because they're not going to have their innate kind of want to be good. And so that's the driving force. So the tragedy of nice guy syndrome is a lot of the guys are actually genuinely nice underneath all the bullshit. What you're seeing is a kind of murky, poisoned, tainted, mutated version of their niceness coming out. You know, just absolutely infected with neediness and approval seeking and manipulation and emotional controlling techniques. Uh, but if you were to wipe all that away, this person would still be good. Put it this way, every nice guy help recover still is a nice person at the end of it. Every single one, without exception. I've never created a jerk, you know. I've never turned a guy into a total asshole selfish prick it never happens they be they become way more confident and assertive and self-respecting but they're still their primary focus is that everybody has a good life you know they just don't do it from such a sort of manipulative passive weak self-serving place anymore so like i said other people can react with different strategies psychopathy criminality drug addiction isolation you know there's lots of ways that people can react to trauma differently and nice guys just one type of reaction it gives me some hope in people because nice guy is such a common response as well. Whereas criminality is such a rare response, you know, less, probably less than 1% of the global population are truly criminals. And, you know, 1% to 3% are, you know, psychopathic in some way. So most people are actually kind of inherently good. And so most people, I, I do believe a majority of people in the world are people pleasers. I don't think I'll ever be out of work. You know what I mean? I think it's kind of, it's even more prevalent than depression. I should also note that there are guys who call themselves nice guys, or they're even that kind of media uh, portrayal of nice guys as these incels who are entitled to women and hate them and end up murdering them and are full of misogyny and bitter. And those aren't nice guys. Okay, they call themselves nice guys in the same way that man haters call themselves feminists. It, they're not. They don't count. They're not part of the group. Because they rarely treat others well. They don't sacrifice themselves for others. Uh, they hate other people rather than themselves. This actually disqualifies them as being nice guys. Nice guys, you know, they might be bitter and resentful about their lack of success with women, but they blame themselves. Right? They worship women. They don't hate them. If you hate women, you know, if you see women as inferior to you and, and you despise them, uh, you're not a nice guy. You're something else. So let's get into it. Like I said, these are 10 off the top of my head. I haven't nailed all of them, but they come up a lot. First is a chaotic or unpredictable parent. Unpredictability is a theme that will come through a lot. Nice guy syndrome is about control, creating predictable, reliable, smooth and problem-free, as Robert Glover would say. 
So often in the childhood, you're going to see unpredictability and chaos and the kind of walking on eggshells that happens when you just don't know what the, you know, the, the rules are. You don't know how it's supposed to go. It never plays out the same way twice. You know, any trauma specialist will tell you when it comes to parenting that predictability and stability are the simplest and most effective things you can establish as a parent. If you can get that going, if you can make it so that your kid knows the routine and knows the rules and doesn't have to guess anything, they're going to feel safe most of the time, assuming that the routine and rules aren't also harmful. But what you get is you get a kid who might feel the need to manage their parents' emotions in order to manage their own emotions. That basically, if I can make sure my parents are having a good time, then I can have a good time. And if I can't do that, if I can't manage my parent, it's hell at home. You know, I don't even want to be there. It can be also to the extreme of violence. You know, I had one client where his dad would just randomly beat the shit out of him almost every day for nothing, for imagined crimes, for, for no reason sometimes. So he's just constantly on edge, just waiting for violence. But much more common is just emotional instability. You know, parents are just... Uh, there's no rhyme or reason to why they feel the negative emotions that they express. The, the child is led to believe or allowed to believe that the, they are the cause of those emotions. You know, the parents don't take responsibility for their own emotional instability. So kind of mama goes, you're driving me crazy, rather than going, I struggle to manage my own anger. It's not your fault. You know, uh, the kid feeling like I am the cause of it. And even if you don't directly say that to a kid, which a lot of parents unfortunately do, but even when you don't, you know, until you're about eight or nine years old, your brain hasn't formed certain functions. And, you know, one function that you get a bit older, that you get when you're a bit older, is that you understand you're not the center of the universe, that other people have their own lives and you they have nothing to do with you. You don't control them. But before that, you are the center. You're everything. So if something's happening at home, it's somehow related to you and you're sure of that. If your mom's pissed off, either you pissed her off or it's your job to fix it or something it's some direct relationship to you that's how children think that's why parents need to be very careful about taking responsibility for their own feelings around their children because the default is the child will blame themselves so i, I you know uh, one person i worked with for many years had a mother who was later diagnosed with borderline personality and she was kind of like just roll the dice and see what you get like she was so random with her moods you know, she could be loving one minute and then shouting at you the next. And all you've done is been sitting there. You know, uh, she could take you out for ice cream and then leave you in the car park and make you walk home because she suddenly changed moods. She was so unpredictable. And yet what my client found, my client who was also on the autism spectrum, there's certain things she could do to reduce the unpredictability. You know, she could placate her mother. She could do things that entertained her mother <clears throat> and get her to the point where, most of the time the feelings were good and it gives her the impression like oh, i finally found something that allows me to survive at home so you can see this playing out into adulthood it's just like as soon as someone gets upset about you and you don't understand why uh you immediately just instantly try to fix it and you try to prevent those kind of feelings from happening because they're associated with just horrific experiences in childhood number two emotionally distant father or lack of a father but more more common is the father's there, he's in the picture, but just in proximity. I've found that guys who are actually raised solely by mothers, uh, they're not so likely to become nice guys. If they have bitterness and trauma, it's more likely to be something misogynistic. Um, or they go down the path of like actually not liking men. Uh, whereas nice guys tend to have the dad there, but the dad is a really poor role model for healthy masculinity. I, in fact, I don't know any nice guys who report having a role model as a father you know a role model of what it means to be a healthy man so generally get the emotionally distant father or the emotionally unpredictable father which we've already covered um but he's kind of impossible to please because you actually don't really know how he feels about you ever you know he might occasionally say that you know good on your boy and but you don't know if he means it he says that to everybody he's, he's just Quite often, nice guys have nice guy fathers. They have a people pleaser in the house, usually the father or the mother sometimes, or both. Um, so they get that kind of modeling, like they see the father interact with the mother as a submissive, passive thing. They're like, okay, so that's what men are supposed to do, you know, and that, that all gets registered. But you got this dad where you just like, you have, to, you have to do so much to get anything out of him, to get any sort of love out of him. 
you have to put on such a show. You have to be a really high performer or really entertaining. Um, and, you know, kids who go the other way, you have to get in trouble. And that's a different path to nice guy. But, you know, one of my clients, his dad was just a classic UK nice guy. You know, everything came out of his mouth. The few times he did speak was just bog standard, small talk cliches. You know, how's your day going? You know, weather's looking good today. I think the cricket's on this afternoon. Like, no personality, nothing. And just bowing down to the mother and, and just having no assertiveness and no spine. And, the boy, you know, the boy's a man now. He's in his early 20s. And he still doesn't know if his dad loves him. He still doesn't know how his dad feels about him. He still has to do so much to get even, like, a hint of any kind of real feelings out of his dad. So when you've got a father like that, you have to try really hard to get love. And that's where you get the try hardness of nice guy syndrome. Number three, again, going along the lines of uh, unpredictability, inconsistent rules and unfair punishments, especially for being just yourself, for being curious, for being honest, for doing a bit of risk taking. You know, if you find that like, you're walking on eggshells. It's like being in a foreign country. You don't know what the laws are, but you keep getting in trouble. You know, the thing where like something was fine yesterday and now it's a crime just because your parents' mood changed. Or, you know, my own experience that one of my great sort of bitterness uh, kind of experiences from childhood was the way I'd find out what the rules are was by breaking them. So the, I, I was, I'd go to jail for like a first offense. You know what I mean? Like, if I did something that I didn't know was against the rules, I would get punished as if I did know. I'd get punished as if I was deliberately flouting the rules. And rules would just be made up on the spot. You know, I'd, maybe I'd go into the uh, the pantry and I'd stand up on a, a barrel to get a packet of chips, suddenly standing on the barrel is against the rules. Something I couldn't possibly predict. And now I'm in trouble because I stood on the barrel. You know, or... Uh, I would get home five minutes late. I don't even have a watch and suddenly I'm grounded for two weeks. I didn't even know lateness was a thing. You know, I, I got in trouble like that a lot. I spent a lot of my childhood grounded for very minor crimes. And it was very obvious to me that this was not happening to the other kids. So it felt very inconsistent, felt very unfair, felt overly harsh, strict. Strict parenting generally and nice guy syndrome go together hand in hand. You know, the only way for a nice guy to actually have a life when he's got strict parents is to become dishonest, is to pretend to be good and be bad on the side. And so, you know, the, the studies that clearly show the more strict the parenting is, the more the children lie. And that was definitely my experience. I had very strict parents who uh, I have a great relationship with now because they've changed and I've changed um, significantly. But back then, I, you know, it was like a, tour of duty you know I, the rules are so so many rules i couldn't possibly keep track of them all sometimes i'd be sitting on a chair in the lounge and i'd be like am i allowed to sit on this chair at this time of day like i, I had no idea what the next thing would be because my parents were stressed and you know broke and they'd just take that out of me without realizing that i'm sitting there thinking that there's some structure to this when there wasn't it was just their mood swings there's some other stuff going on in the background as well but that kind of thing leads you to just be very unsure of yourself being like a pending doom that you're always going to get in trouble and a need to try and prevent that trouble from finding you. And that's where you get the placatory element of nice guy syndrome. Like nice guys are always trying to anticipate and prevent negative emotions because they associate people feeling upset with being in trouble. And they think that there's like just so many rules when a, when a nice guy gets into a relationship, He'll imagine all these rules about what he can and can't do and say and become quite passive and weak and often not speak his mind, not do what he feels like doing. You know, he'll sacrifice his friendships and his hobbies because in some part, in some way, he thinks I'll get in trouble if I do those things that I want to do because that's what happened when I was a kid. Nice guys always, you know, they always have problems with binging and addiction as well in various forms. You know, maybe it's sugar, maybe it's drugs, maybe it's Netflix. Because when they get out of the house, they're finally allowed to do stuff and they just, you know, overcorrect. And that was me with sugar, an addiction that I'm currently battling and maybe winning. But I, I was only allowed to have one treat per week, uh, you know, like one chocolate bar per week. I'm talking about when I'm like nine, ten years old and all my friends are just, they're allowed to eat whatever they feel like and they get their own money to buy it and so on. <clears throat> so 
I did this extremely strict thing. So when I finally got out home, I was just like, oh, sugar, finally, I can do whatever I want, you know. And nice guys tend to have that, like, you know, black and white fallacy problem. So if you're really strict on a child, they'll tend to be big rule breakers later on just to kind of make up for lost time. Uh, and then you get that kind of paradox of the nice guy who's actually doing a lot of bad stuff. At least bad to himself. Number four, peer bullying and ostracism. You know, being picked on, being left out, not fitting in. These are common complaints with my clients from their early social experiences. But it's not so common that it happens to everyone. I personally did not have this experience uh, later. You know, I always had a peer group in late primary school and throughout high school. It was only later on that I realized that peer group wasn't quite as uh, loving as I thought they were, but I really felt like I was in the group. Now, that's actually quite, kind of a rare experience for nice guys. Many more, probably more than 50%, actually report feeling like they're on their own a lot. Uh, that they couldn't fit in, that they were the weird one, or they only had a couple of friends, and they're friends with the other weird kids, and so on. Uh, all the way through to outright bullying, being targeted and, and brutally punished and, and picked on by other kids, uh, or by their own parents, or by their older brothers, that kind of thing. So you get this uh, overall picture of you don't belong, you're not good enough for us, you're not cool enough to be in the group, and it can lead one of two ways for nice guys. So you get the either the wallflower type of nice guy where he realizes, hey, if nobody notices me, nothing bad happens. So they're still ostracized and they don't fit in, but at least no punishments coming their way. And they just kind of sneak away into the background. You know, the more uh, introverted types will have a tendency to go that way because they don't have the kind of extroverted power. Extroverts like myself eventually if they're lucky enough a lot of them do they cotton on to something that does get approval and does get them in with the group you know for me it was being funny i found that being funny got me in with the group uh and of my peers and i found that being academically talented got me in the group with adults so i found a way to make kids like me and a way to make adults like me and i'd oscillate between being the funny kid and the smart kid depending on the audience <clears throat> it was a tough one because being the smart kid with other kids wasn't so popular right so i had to dumb it down and play it down and pretend that i wasn't as smart as i was and that i didn't read as many books as i did and so on and then with you know with the adults it wasn't that i had to not be funny but i had to sophisticate the funniness you know i had to use adult humor uh and and kind of like meet them at their level um <clears throat> and that's that's generally what happens as a nice guy finds a strategy to either fit in or at least not stand out in a negative way and continues that strategy into adulthood so you get the the chandler bing style guy who's always funny all the time and never seems to grow up the peter pan thing um what i've found is uh, an interesting side note that i think is related is many 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 of the nice guys i've worked with report moving a lot when they were younger so lots of different schools you know, I personally had three schools by the time I was seven. Um, and a lot of the nice guys, you know, when I run a group program or something, I say, hey, raise your hand if you moved more than two or three times before you're 10, you know, and all the hands go up. This is actually really disruptive to move a lot when your child is young. And I, I plan to try and avoid doing that as much as possible with my own kid or children. Um, because... It takes time for a kid to establish a clique, and a group, an in-group of friends. And if you disrupt that, they have to start over again. But the problem is if they have to start over again, they're the new kid. Who remembers being the new kid at school? Is there anything fucking more horrifying than walking into a school knowing it's already established? You know, I, I, I left my first school, I think, after six months. So it's halfway through the year. That me, a little five and a half year old or whatever I was, going to a new school, everything's already established, all on my own, trying to fit in. I mean, kids aren't that cruel. My first school, I don't remember that well, but I just remember just feeling intimidated a lot. Not by the kids, but just by the situation I was in. New kid at school, you know? Um, at my second school, I just couldn't find a friend. I had like two mates. One was my neighbor who was just friend by default. And then this one other kid who was also ostracized. And me and this other kid would hang out. 
Well, there might have been one more. And we were all just, the, you know, we're the freaks and geeks. And if one of them was off sick from school or something, I was fucked. I had no one to hang out with because the groups were already established. I couldn't worm my way in there. I didn't have social skills. Fucking five and a half years old. I don't know how to like break into a group and take over leadership. I don't know shit. But then I got to my third school um, and I can't remember why it worked out, but partly it was a smaller school. So there was only one group to be part of that helped. But also I discovered being funny. And uh, once I discovered being funny, plus I think my dad coached the sports team, that helped as well, sort of gave me an in. Uh, I managed to finally establish a friend group, but that establishment was kind of luck. There's a lot of nice guys that doesn't happen to. So nice guy syndrome is ultimately a syndrome to try and get love, isn't it? It's a strategy to try and get love and to try and feel loved. So you can see why somebody who's ostracized, bullied, left out might develop such a strategy. Uh, number five, being judged on performance and achievements and being punished for being less than. So being compared to others, being held to a higher standard than the other kids. You know, this kind of thing can lead to nice guy syndrome in terms of trying to seek approval from older people like your parents and teachers and such. I had one, I've had numerous uh, clients who are Chinese, you know, second generation in another country. So... You might get a Chinese Kiwi, uh, but his parents are still like full on Chinese, like don't even speak English and conservative Chinese, traditional Chinese. And, you know, I had one client I remember that really well, like I don't think he ever heard words of love from his parents ever had proper like crazy tiger parents. And he came home once and he had gotten like 99% on a spelling test. And his dad just said, well, where's the other 1%? Top marks in the class. And it still wasn't good enough for dad you know and that kind of thing happened a lot constantly just being told you know i wish you were as smart as your brothers you're a waste of time you're horrible things like that but it can be even more subtle than that you know just like like oh, i wish you're more like your brother like that's devastating to say to a kid so like, oh look at kathy's son he's doing so well why can't you be more like kathy's son you know and that's when the comparison to others thing starts for nice guys of like fuck i'm in competition the love is scarce. You have to earn it. Only the winner takes home the trophy and everybody else loses. And again, you get the either approval seeker or, or disapproval avoider. So the approval seeker, someone like myself, thinks, actually, I think I can win this competition. I'm going to go hard and get the love and beat the other kids because maybe you've got a natural talent in the classroom or you've got a sports or some way that you can impress people. But the people who don't naturally find a way to impress others, they'll be like, I'll just try to pretend I'm not in the competition. You know, I'll just try to go unnoticed so that I don't spark disapproval in comparison with others, you know. But, you know, I mean, from my own childhood, I was forced to do like two hours of homework every night, like not locked in my room, but certainly shut in there. And I couldn't find another kid who had to go through that. I was like, why do I have such intense pressure on me to do well at school? Even though I'm already doing well, I'm already in the top class. Like, when's it going to be enough? When can they just relax and go, ah, you're smart enough, that'll do. You know, they were trying their best, but it was really like the fact that I was like, I felt like I was in competition, but there was no grand prize. I couldn't win. Every time I did better, I just had to do better. Like I got it. I got the award for ducks at my primary school. I mean, there wasn't a lot of competition, but ducks is basically the smartest kid in the school. I got that award. That got me into the smartest, you know, like brainy group in my year of high school. And all my parents did in response is up the workload. They kept putting more pressure on me to do well academically, uh, which just made no sense to me. I'm like, I'm at the top. Can't I fucking cruise? <laughs> you know, like, what do you want me to do? Be better than the teachers? Like, be one of those prodigy kids that goes to university when they're 14? Like, I'm not going to be that. I've, I've maxed out. I'm not actually that smart. I'm just good at pleasing others through studying. So being judged on performance, like having the love given or withheld based on how well you achieve at you know certain things not like not moral things not principles not values but external socially approved of things like are you a good kid in other people's eyes you know if you if you were uh, judged in such a way nice guy syndrome's the response isn't it number six enmeshment not so common but only not so common because people weren't aware that that's what was happening now enmeshment is also known as emotional incest. 
And what it is, it's where one of your parents has a relationship with you that's not parent and child, but something closer to partnership. Now, I don't mean sexual abuse, though that can also be part of it. It's not so much the thing I'm referring to. What I'm talking about is quite often the mother and the son. Like I said, most of my clients are men, and the issues they have with their parents are generally quite gender specific you know there's a set of issues that happen with the father and a set of issues that happen with the mother and emotional incest is one of the mother issues you know especially in broken homes you know especially when there's a divorce and it's just the mother and son spending a lot of time together or you know they're not divorced but the marriage is for shit and the dad's you know deadbeat or whatever the mum will form a relationship with the son where you know she's telling him her secret she's oversharing um she's saying like i wish i could find a man like you or you know i wish all the boys were like you and you know you're you're nothing like your father or even worse like whenever you misbehave you're like oh, you're just like your father you know this kind of like comparing you to someone who was her partner or is her partner which is a weird comparison it's like we're not in the same category i'm your son don't compare me to your your lover you know um but just generally, generally like sort of the connection is one-sided you're maybe treated like a therapist you're expected to like soothe your mother's emotions that kind of thing and that can create somebody who you know worships women somebody who sees it as their job to make women feel good as their job to uh, make women feel happy and to listen to their problems and you know take care of them and fix them and so on somebody who has a codependency relationship with their mother is likely to project that onto future women so again not so common but very powerful and then if you think about it you might find that it was true even though you've never thought about it before though it is a horrible thing to think about um you know to face the fact that your your parent treated you like a partner even if you know there wasn't a sexual element to it uh, it can be quite a quite a disgusting feeling <clears throat> but it'll help you understand like why am i always looking for a partner who's like my mother or why do I treat women like uh, they're a princess and I'm a servant? Like, what, where does that dy dynamic come from? Why am I being the man in the relationship? Why am I being the therapist? Well, have a look at how you and your mum get on. Yeah. Number seven. This one's an interesting one. Might be more common than I give it credit for, but you can actually have a relatively decent childhood, but you have these random small events that are very powerful and significant and the way they're interpreted and the way they're handled leads you to develop nice guy syndrome. So there are some nice guys who actually like, maybe I've even met their parents or heard their parents described. I'm like, yeah, I mean, there's some things here and there, but I think your parents are all right. And that actually might be my parents as well. Like, like I said, my parents were probably too strict on me. I was judged on performance. Uh, my dad was emotionally distant until later, later in my life. There's some of the elements there, but that might have not being the reason why I became a nice guy because there were other things that happened that I have such powerful quite traumatic memories about that I think really shaped particularly how I interact with women and how I viewed women uh, and also what I thought it meant to be a good person and a good boy you know um, for one you know I've heard a lot of my male clients describe a powerful moment in their early childhood you know before the age of 10 where they were led to believe that sexuality from a man is bad and harmful. It can be as small as watching a sitcom where it always looks like the woman has to give up sex and that the man is this like begging sleazy guy trying to get it and looks like it's some burden on the woman. It can just be something subtle like that where you're like, oh, men hurt women with the sexuality. And you're not just thinking about sex as in the act of penetration, but you're just thinking about being sexual, being romantic, showing interest, showing attraction. All of that's in one category together, and you think, fuck, I better shut that down. You know, look how much it hurts people. It can be an event like that. Like, there's one story, I won't, I've already done a piece on it, but uh, these girls came up to me when I was in primary school. I'm just fucking around with my friends, and they said, oh, this girl likes you, you know, I won't say her name. It says she likes you you know like little kids do like someone likes you you want to be boyfriend and girlfriend you're like seven you don't know what the fuck you're doing i don't know how old i was somewhere eight nine ten something like that and i just spontaneously blurted something out something that i didn't even understand what i said but i said uh well tell her i want to fuck her then which sounds horrible when you see i hear a man say it like that but i didn't even know what fucking was 
Mate, they're a word. I thought people rub their bellies together. I don't know about penetration and all the like bits and pieces of it. I, you know, I, I was born before internet porn. I don't understand any of this shit, right? So <clears throat> they screamed and ran away, which instantly went, made me go, oh, I said something wrong. I'm fucking in trouble. I don't know what. I don't know how exactly, but I fucked up. I didn't have a chance to like reel them back in. Like, no, 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 I'm just kidding or whatever. It was over. But the way that was handled, I was humiliated and shamed. You know, I had to watch this video on sexual harassment. I had to write letters of apology to her and to her parents. My parents, you know, they heard a one-sided story from the school came down on me really hard. I was basically treated like I'd actually sexually assaulted this girl. When actually I just said something that I didn't even understand. I wasn't trying to be sexual at all. Now, I'm not trying to... Uh, diminish the effect it would have had on the girl you know obviously given the reaction she took it pretty badly and uh, i feel really bad for her if only i'd had a chance to talk it out with us if only it'd been moderated better if a teacher got together and said daniel what did you mean when you said that no look i fucking don't know what i mean really you know and she'd been there and we talked it through and just said look i was nervous because you liked me and stoked and those words just came out and i would never harm you and so on you know that conversation might have happened and it might have gone better for her too who knows how traumatized she was from that experience but the way they handled it my lesson was never be sexual it hurts people you know and combined with lots of other little elements i was like okay i'm never fucking doing that again and i spent most of my 20s completely sexless directly as a result of that one experience you know and a lot of nice guys have one experience. You know, they boldly ask a girl out and they just chose the wrong girl and she just publicly humiliates them. You know what I mean? Or they just, you know, I had one parent, over, uh, one client overheard his mum talk about how men are sleazy and he worshipped his mum, loved his mum. And he goes, all right, I'd never want to be one of those men because, but he doesn't, nobody sat down and explained, look, this is what we mean by sleazy. Most guys aren't actually like this. And as long as you do this and so on, you know, Nobody explained it. He had to figure it out for himself. And so he figured out like, okay, just don't talk to girls. That ought to do it. So it's amazing. Like I said, hair trigger sensitivity, a small event can turn into nice guy syndrome because no one's there to kind of come and collect the pieces. And there's not enough sort of counterweight. You don't have like a powerful role model as a father or something to, uh, you know, counterweight the little bits and pieces. See, little things won't affect a kid if they've got a lot of positive influence to counteract it. But if the kid doesn't have other positive influences or has other negative ones that are aligned with this, then the kid's got no chance, right? They're going to be massively affected. All right, number eight, the culture of man-hating feminism. Boys being told it's bad to be masculine in one way or another. You know, when I was younger, I definitely remember a kind of messaging about men are rapists. You know, I didn't even really know what rape was as a kid. Later, I understood it as a teenager. But again, it's just more very strong messaging that just even a guy showing interest in a girl somehow harms her. And that men are just inherently harmful. It's just bad to be a man. And what boys do is they look at all this messaging and they go, well, I can't help but be a guy. So I'm just going to be ashamed of myself forever. That's sorted. We'll do that. But what can I do to like minimize how much of a guy I am? You know, how can I reduce the harm that I'm causing? And so they start to observe, you know, the behaviors that are associated with men, that masculine behaviors, you know, guys being assertive, guys being rude, guys being violent. These are things that they are definitely harmful, but there's other ones that are less so, like being assertive isn't objectively harmful, but if it goes into the category of masculinity, the little boy goes, well, that one's out. You know, it feels so much more comfortable and they start getting this feedback you know girls saying oh you're such a nice guy you're so lovely and they're like oh this turning off the man shit really does work you know and uh, that was my experience the you know, the less manly i was the better feedback i got from especially from females and guys didn't really have much feedback at all plus i was playing a different role with everybody so i'd be a bit harder with me and you go play rugby and joke about shit but with girls i was also, i'd actually change my voice to be softer you know I used to call it my gentle voice. I talk probably like how most therapists talk. Take all the bass out. So even taking the bass out of my voice, I, I just like castrated myself as much as possible. And lots and lots of nice guys do this because they can't figure out like what exactly the bad bit about being a man is. So they just delete the whole thing, you know, baby with the bathwater. 
never realizing in the first place that the messaging they're getting is not accurate. They're getting it from people who hate men. You know, it's not a good place to get your information about men. Again, they don't have that counterweight of a powerful male role model to go like, here's how you be a man. Don't listen to these stupid idiots. Like, here's how you can do it without harming anybody. It's perfectly fine. You can do it like this. Number nine. Well, nine and ten have something in common. This is where you actually get positive feedback. So number nine is validation and approval for people pleasing and dishonesty. So this happens a bit later. It's more teenage years. Uh, depending on when you get started, when it kicks in, it might be your first relationship that really starts to happen or uh, your first proper peer group. But this little strategy you've been toying with of being a nice guy in whichever way it is, maybe you're the performer, maybe you're the manipulator, manipulative controller, maybe you're the wallflower, you start to get positive feedback. People start telling you that you're a good person, that they like you, they laugh at your jokes, they include you in their groups, uh, they stop hurting you you know you get the validation of being left alone if that was the thing you're actually going for it starts working doesn't it you know fuck it it's actually paying out finally i figured a way you know for me it was being funny and i totally get stand-up comedians almost all of them would be nice guys almost all of them to get started to go like get up on stage do something they're brave has to be a big reward and the big reward is like fuck i can get a whole room to love me for like 15 minutes you know um, and so they go up there and they just seek that approval and they get it. And I, I used to play that role, but it's just in my friend group. I'd just be the one always creating the laughs and telling the stories and keeping everyone entertained. Um, others, they just do really well at school, perhaps, or they're really good at sports or they're in the band. And, you know, <laughs> I did all of these things, but they find something that works and that thing comes with a cost around integrity. They have to be dishonest to do the thing. They can't say how they really think and feel. They can't show weaknesses. They can't be negative. Um, and that it has to be something that pleases others. It can't be some random weird thing that nobody likes. So there's a compromise that takes place. But because it's working so well and you feel so good about the reaction you're getting, you don't care so much about the compromise. I mean, you know what? Like a 14-year-old boy, who, what does he give a fuck about integrity? He's just trying to get a kiss from girls. He'll do anything. He doesn't give a fuck. And this is why it doesn't pay out later on in life when the laughs die down or it doesn't actually get you that far or, you know, even if it does, there's no real inner reward. You just feel empty and hollow and lonely all the time and you can't get high off it anymore. And then you also don't have your integrity. You don't even know who you are. So it's a double loss. Number 10, validation again, but this time for high achievement. You know, getting love from doing well. So as opposed to being likable, you're impressive. Uh, many nice guys will do both. They'll do the thing that makes them likable and they'll do something that makes them impressive. Like for me, I was funny, but I also did really well at school. So I kind of stacked up my odds to be as likable as possible and approved of um, in high quantity. So you found a way to finally get some love. You know, maybe you do well in the sports field. Maybe something finally makes your dad go, well, you're good at that. And you're like, holy shit, he said something. Fuck, I'm doing that for the rest of my life. You know, you get the kind of nice guy who goes into the family business, even though he doesn't like the job, because finally something that his dad approves of, or the person who, you know, marries a girl that his parents like, because finally, you know, or just marries a girl because she likes him. Finally, somebody likes me. I mean, I know so many guys... God, we used to disparagingly call them one joiners, and I don't mean to offend anyone listening, but the guy who basically married the first girl that he liked. Now, there must be some cases where that really is true love and compatibility, and you just nailed it on your first go. But I'd suggest in most cases, it's a form of desperation of like, fuck, somebody loves me, cling for life. You know, I think it's a form of anxious attachment style. The idea you're like, yeah, maybe I should just like get arranged, figure out what I even want and who I am before I choose one forever. You know, which is generally what healthy and confident people do. You know, they sample the buff buffet before they decide what they really want to eat. Um, but, you know, people will commit to a career. I, I went to school, uh, went to university and signed up to a communications degree. I didn't even know why I wanted to go to university. I hadn't even looked far enough ahead to go, like, what point is, is there in me getting this degree? Like, wh where am I going with this? But everybody just approved of how well I did at school. And I thought, well, that's just another school. That'll do, right? And I often did jobs because somebody offered it to me. I just took the path of least resistance. 
and whatever I did, I tried to win, you know, when I, even when I got into dancing, and this is after I've done a lot of work on myself, when I got into dancing, I just felt this compulsion to compete and to train really hard and win the competitions. It's just like, can't I just enjoy fucking dancing? It's like, no, nah, I got to win all the time. I got to achieve. That's how I want people to say, oh, dance the best to dance with. Right? I couldn't just be another middle of the pack dancer who's just having fun on a Saturday night. No, I've got to be the guy who shows up and people go, oh, Dan's here. You know? Now, I eventually got over that and now I am a middle of the pack dancer who can just enjoy it without being the hero. Uh, but that took a lot of work. I had to like let go of trying to win. I mean, I got to the point where I actually co founded a dance school and I just went, fuck, I'm going way too far with this shit. It's supposed to be a hobby. What the fuck am I doing? You know? I haven't even got my coaching business off the ground properly and now I'm running a dance school. Fucking relax, cunt. Anyway, so those are my top 10, though there's probably more. And I want you to note that these are these are deeply embedded. When you something happens to you in childhood, you can imagine it like layers of the brain. You know, like you have a, uh, if you've got like those layers you get when a cliff falls away and you see all the time through the layers um, in the ground. Some layers are untouchable. There's some parts of nice guy syndrome that happened before you were three years old. You know, the, I can see it in my daughter, you know, she's only two and I can already see her tendencies occasionally to try and, you know, get what she wants by seeking approval and stuff. Now, it's nothing completely unhealthy, but I was just like, wow, this shit could start pretty early, actually. If you've got a really emotionally unstable parent, you're already going to be doing some basic strategies when you're like two years old. You won't even remember it. Your earliest memory is what, four or five years old, maybe? Imagine how much shit you got away with before then. Imagine how early this strategy goes back. How deeply embedded in the brain it is, how you know reinforced it is from so many hundreds of thousands of repetitions that you're not going to cure this. I, you know, I sometimes sort of um, use the word cure lightheartedly, but really, nice guy is about recovery. It's about management. You got to know what it is you do that's nice guy syndrome and how that's different to living with integrity and you've got to consciously change one behavior over to the other when you make your decisions until the other way becomes more consistent and more natural to you um and because of course it's authentic to you but i have to watch it forever like i'm always keeping an eye on it am i people pleasing am i fixing you know am i sulking right now or am i being honest you know and i have to watch it and i slip and i get it wrong because my default is so deep in the brain that I can't even get to it. And, uh, but what I can do is I can stop it arising in my behavior. I can catch it as it's thoughts in my head and go, no, 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 we're not doing that shit again and do the other thing instead. So you need to practice ways of living that override that immature strategy and, and those urges you get. Uh, and that's a long-term piece of work. Well, it's a lifelong piece of work. Of course, if you want help doing that piece of work and you want to figure out what the other way is and how to transition from one to the other, get in touch, dan at brojo.org. Thank you so much for listening. Please uh, feel free to comment below with anything you think I've missed or any uh, critique or uh, thoughts you want to share on what I've talked about. And I'll see you guys next time. Cheers.